Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Our guest today is Tom Graff. Tom is the head of investments for Facet Wealth and has several decades leading fixed income departments. Tom joins us today to provide his thoughts on the recent Fed meeting and the second quarter GDP numbers and their implications for the economy and the future path of Fed policy. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, David. I'm a longtime fan of the podcast, so this is really exciting to, to be on. Well, Tom, it's great to have you on the show, and you're another individual I have met on Twitter. Twitter has been a really productive place for me to meet people like you and learn from people like you, people who care about issues we discuss on this show. And it's great to have you as well because you come from the marketplace. I come from a more academic setting, so I get to bounce ideas off of you. And we've been doing this online for some time, so it's great to have you on. This is long overdue. Should have had you on the show several years ago, but in any event, glad to get you here. And I must say, Tom, this is a bit of an experiment. We are meeting the day after the FOMC meeting, and we're trying to do a quick turnaround episode. Typically, we have you know multiple episodes in the pipeline, so this will be an experiment in getting a quick turnaround, given that the FOMC meeting in July has been so topical, such a discussed issue. And then on top of that, today we had the GDP numbers, and so we're here to talk about that as well. GDP numbers... What do they mean for the recession? And then Fed policy, what have we learned going forward, uh, what to expect? So let's talk about the GDP numbers. And there's been a lot of debate about what a recession is, what it means. And I want to ask you, what is your takeaway from the GDP numbers today? Then how do you use that to think about this debate over what is a recession? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be part of Macro Musings history with this quick turnaround. So what you're referring to is the GDP came out today. It was the second straight negative quarter for GDP, which is a traditional sort of rule of thumb for what the definition of a recession might be. Of course, your readers know, your listeners know that formally the a recession is declared by the NBER. Even if one were starting right now, we wouldn't know it for many months, most likely. You know, honestly, I think it's a little silly to say we're in a recession right now because, you know, by most measures, the economy is still extremely strong. We've had some of the best job growth we've ever had in the last six months. Consumer spending is still really hot. I mean, frankly, that's why we have an inflation problem, right? So the other thing I would just point out is that the first quarter GDP being negative was quite spurious. You know, the final demand numbers, which basically takes out some of the trade impact was quite positive. So the only reason why it was negative was because import numbers were so high and having really strong imports is a sign of a strong economy, not a weak economy. But this quarter is a little different. So this quarter, the biggest negative effect was from fixed investment, right, which includes home building and equipment purchases by companies and stuff like that. And that going negative, pretty notable, right? Like that's probably a first order effect of the Fed tightening financial conditions. It's sort of interesting that that's happened so quickly, you know, because remember, this GDP is only counting April, May, and June. And a lot of those fixed investments decisions are made over an extended period. So the fact that that's turned negative so quickly is, is definitely notable. Yes, I have found that striking too. And as you mentioned, a little surprising because you think of monetary policy working with Long and variable lags, as Milton Friedman said. But as my colleague Scott Sumner likes to say, monetary policy can also work with long and variable leads when it comes to the financial conditions and in turn, these investments, as you mentioned. So the Fed has tightened financial conditions and they are already having an impact on housing and construction. So I guess the takeaway is monetary policy works and has worked really quickly. That's, I guess, the surprising side of it, how quickly it has affected investment in housing and and construction. So the numbers were negative for Q1 and Q2, even after the revisions. And I was someone who thought maybe Q1 would have been revised far up so that it was close to positive or zero at least, but that did not pan out. And so it's the case that it's negative. It is worth noting, though, that real gross domestic income for the first quarter was actually positive. So while we still have a negative Q1 number, 
of 1.6, the gross domestic income grew at 1.8. And what's interesting, as you know, Tom, is that gross domestic income is total income earned in the economy, and GDP is gross domestic product or total spending. And in theory, those two things should be equal, right? Total income is what's used on total spending. So in theory, they should be equal. They're not. There's some kind of measurement error. But it, what it suggests is then that first quarter may not be as bad as the GDP numbers suggest. And gross domestic income has had a better track record in some cases of relaying what the underlying state of the economy is. So it's just another data point that goes along with what you were mentioning in terms of employment, growth, household spending, things that seem to be relatively strong. Now, with all that said, the second quarter GDP numbers, as you noted, they do look more troubling. And should we have another quarter of decline in real GDP, I would then invoke the rule of thumb of two quarters a recession then. I just don't think the first quarter is a good place to start that rule of thumb. But going forward, I think it is given we are seeing weakness. So the real issue then is going forward, are we headed into a recession? Will the economy weaken? Will the Fed you know, go too far, not engineer a soft landing, but a hard one? So what are your thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah, so Chair Powell said it yesterday in the Fed meeting that it was probably going to be necessary for the economy to slow over the next couple quarters, and moreover, that that's pretty likely. So clearly, we're not going to solve the inflation problem we have without aggregate demand coming down, and aggregate demand coming down almost certainly means slower GDP growth. So I think what he's thinking there in saying that a slowdown is pretty likely is that there's there's a lot of tailwinds that either because of Fed policy or just because the natural course of things that are probably fading now. So consumers have normalized their credit card spending over the last couple quarters, and that was probably been a, been a big boost to spending. But now it's pretty normal, and so it's probably not going to continue to be a big tailwind. There's also probably been a decent amount of home equity withdrawal that is probably not going to keep going, particularly as interest rates have risen by a lot and, and home prices may not fall, but they may not keep rising in a big way. And lastly, consumers have probably spent down a fair amount of savings that built up during the pandemic when it was hard to spend on things like vacations and whatnot. So it's probably played out. So those things are sort of the natural things that are probably just going to go away. But then you also heard there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that companies may be slowing the pace of hiring. We saw in this GDP report, but we've also heard it from companies like Walmart and Target that they maybe built up a little too much inventory so far this year and they're going to have to spend it down. It tends to be a sign that the economy is going to slow at least temporarily. And of course, you do have the cumulative effect of monetary policy, which should be something of a slowing impact on the economy. So I do think definitely slower pace in the second half is quite likely than what we saw you know, a year ago, let's say. Whether it ultimately turns recessionary or not, I think it's an elevated risk right now, but I don't know that it's you know for certain. Okay, and that's a great point you've highlighted there that even in the absence of the Fed tightening, there have been some natural slowdown, you know, coming out of the pandemic, people spending down their balances, normalizing their their behavior. So, great points. One last observation about this question about recession or not, and that is the inverted yield curve, and we'll come back to this later probably if we have time, but it's inverted, but it didn't invert till like April, right? Or till the second quarter of this year. So if you use another rule of thumb, the inverted yield curve, it would suggest the recession is ahead of us. It would be a very weird reading to have a yield curve say the recession occurred before it inverted. So I guess that'd be just another data point. I guess I would say on the inverted yield curve in the old days, David, (laughs) that an inversion meant that the Fed was sort of above neutral and at some point would go below neutral or at least fall back to neutral, right? And that's why short-term rates needed to be high, but long-term rates were lower than short-term rates. It's sort of a weird period here where because the Fed has been so upfront about how quickly they were planning on hiking, right? Short-term yields almost immediately priced all that in. I think the curve flattened faster than it has in past cycles. So that might mess up the timing of the signal you're mentioning. I guess we'll find out, but it's at least a plausible outcome to me. 
And to be fair, the last time it inverted was right before 2018 or during 2018, and we didn't have a recession then. I guess you could argue the pandemic recession, but the link between that and the inversion is is not there. So it's very different. Not there. <laughs> no, not there. So to be fair, the yield curve is not perfect, and it's a rule of thumb, and that's what I would caution all the listeners. So is two quarters of negative growth, a rule of thumb, and that's all they are. One last thing. I mentioned that was the last thing, but I, I lied. One more thing. As you know, I'm a big fan of following nominal GDP as, as a way to think about demand spending, and some would prefer final sales, but all in nominal terms. And I just wanted to highlight, this is from the BEA report. They say current dollar GDP or nominal GDP increased 7.8% at an annual rate or $465 billion in the second quarter to a level of $24.85 trillion. And they mentioned in the first quarter, it grew at an annualized rate at 6.6%. So if we're thinking in terms of aggregate demand, it's still pretty robust, right? It's still pretty strong. And Yes, a lot of it's going directly into prices, not real growth, but that's you know $465 billion worth of spending that occurred in Q2. So two things. One, it would suggest there's still activity out there. And two, the Fed has its work cut out for it still. If it wants to have that soft landing, there's a lot of aggregate demand to rein in still. No doubt, no doubt. Let's move to the Fed. And again, this was the original motivation. So we want to spend some time here and get your hot take, but informed take on the FOMC yesterday. And so as listeners probably know, July FOMC, the Fed raised for a second time its target interest rate, 75 basis points to the 2.25 to two and a half range. What was your takeaway? What questions did you have? What is your overall sense of that decision? Well, so, you know, as we already said, everybody knows the economy is probably slowing exactly how much is to be determined. But Powell acknowledged that. The market knows that. Everybody is, is on the same page there. And I think everybody is on the same page that this is a necessary thing in order to quell inflation. So what the market's trying to figure out is how much more tightening is going to be necessary. And moreover, how much tightening the Fed is willing to do, even in the face of a weakening economy. There's this dance that goes on between <laughs> markets and central bankers. Powell knows that's what the market's thinking, right? He was even asked a question during the press conference about the fact that futures prices have some rate cuts priced in, and he was attempted to downplay that, which I'll talk about in a second. But so he knows this is going, this is kind of the way I think about it as a market participant. When he's communicating, he is sort of talking to me as a market participant. He's talking to me about what he wants me to think and do, as well as talking to the broader public, because he knows that by getting investors to do certain things, he can change the financial conditions in ways that are important to them. So, you know, I think he continues to go out of his way to be as hawkish as he can be and make sure everybody knows the Fed is resolutely committed to bringing down inflation, no matter what other consequences may occur. I mentioned a moment ago where he said, he was asked this question about, well, the market has rate cuts priced in for 2023. And he said, I don't know about that because our dots say we're going to still be hiking. I think that's an example of where it may be true that in his mind, he says, well, maybe if the economy gets weak enough, we might do that. But he can't say it because if he does, that would influence the way financial conditions evolve. And that might get in the way of the policy outcomes that he's looking to do. So so as a market participant, I got to think through that. Like I got to think going to sort of hear what's not being said, right, as well as what is being said. And so I'll just give my take on what I think, you know, was not being said, but is being thought. I think the fact that Powell more or less withdrew forward guidance, he more or less said, look, I don't know what we're going to do in September or November, for that matter, I think is a sign that he's less sure that having this kind of maximum hawkish position is going to continue to be either necessary or desired as we evolve over the next couple quarters. So by the way, the market took it that way. So both bonds and stocks rallied quite a bit. So meaning bond yields fell and stock prices rose quite a bit over the course of the press conference. So I think it was almost a universal thought that maybe, maybe not pivot so much, but maybe a downshift of pace is going on. So speaking of forward guidance, you did a Twitter thread on it yesterday or the day before. But in, in general, what is your sense of forward guidance as a market participant? Yeah. So it gets derided a lot, actually, amongst market participants. I can speak to why it's not totally unfounded, but I think we should bear in mind of how effective forward guidance has been in the last two cycles, going back to the to the GFC. You know, back then people forget, but 
in the beginning part of the Fed cutting rates all the way to zero in late 2008, the market didn't really believe it was going to stay that way for very long. Like futures markets were pricing hikes a year or so into the future at the time, which seems silly now because we know they didn't hike till 2015. But like at the time, people were like, well, this is a weird policy that exists only for this emergency moment. And when the acute emergency is passed, that's going to end. And and had that continued, had the market not realized how serious then Chair Bernanke was about keeping that maximum policy position, you know, I don't think we would have gotten the monetary thrust that we got that ultimately helped us get out of that recession, right? So that was the sort of initial part of this this version of forward guidance that we have now. Fast forward to today, right? When COVID hit, right? And the Fed cut to zero and said, we're going to keep it here as long as we need to. The market believed it right away because they were used to this forward guidance thing, right? And so they got the kind of boom policy outcome that they were looking for. And then more recently, you know, we were talking a moment ago about how quickly the market priced in a large number of rate hikes. If you contrast this hiking period with 1994, which was the last time they were anywhere near this aggressive, financial conditions just inched along in real time with Fed hikes in 1994. So they didn't get to anywhere near this amount of kind of policy shift for a whole year. Whereas Powell was able to get that to happen in a couple months. I think that's going to wind up with better outcomes this time around than would otherwise be, right? So there are problems with forward guidance. And I think what people most often criticize the Fed with, and I think this came up in the presser yesterday, was whether forward guidance sort of caused them to be too slow to hike this time around. And Powell denied that. But I actually agree with Powell in this case. I'm not totally sure that was the main culprit. I think the main culprit was they were kind of fighting the last war, right? They were sort of worried about tightening too quickly with inflation that really up until the fall of last year did look transitory, you know? So I think that was more to blame, just kind of the strangeness of the cycle and how inflation was playing out in the moment. I think it's fair to criticize the Fed, and Powell sort of took a mea culpa on this. It's fair to criticize the Fed that, well, maybe it could have tapered a little quicker and that would have gotten you to hiking a little quicker. But I don't know that's a wildly different outcome, right? Like, I don't know that inflation is you know, totally different now. Maybe reputationally, I'm sure he would rather have moved a bit quicker because it would feel a little different to regular consumers and to market participants. But I don't know that we want to totally throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, I do think at this moment, right, it's smarter to give no guidance than it is to suggest maybe a cut would happen at some point down the road. As I said earlier, you don't want to prematurely allow the market to think you're pivoting, it'll show a lack of resolve. That's not what they want. So I totally understand why right this moment you want to pull it away, but I don't think it's going away. I think it's a useful tool for setting policy. So forward guidance is effective. You're saying it empowers the Fed. In fact, it gives the Fed more ammunition. They can make a little move with a big bang because they've guided people like you. In fact, they encourage people like you to do the heavy lifting for them. They've got us trained. <laughs> yeah, they've got they've us got trained. trained. You've been but trained in the school do. of hard knocks of forward guidance. So it's never going away for sure. So one of the criticisms, I mean, of this, and I think we talked about this this week with the Ellen Mead on the podcast is that it can lead to some misunderstanding of what the Fed intends. And maybe that's a, this is a different issue. Maybe this is a communication versus forward guidance per se. So, you know, in 2020, early 2021, if you looked at, you know, the summary of economic projections, they had zero interest rates for three years out or more, you know. And some people took that to be like unconditional. It's going to be this way. Even though those forecasts are conditional, they're like, okay, given the state of the economy, given what we think is optimal monetary policy, do you get that sense that sometimes there's confusions between, you know, this is set in stone versus we are very data dependent? I think Ellen's criticism was right, that they maybe intentionally, maybe semi-intentionally, like let it slip into something unconditional, which we know it's got to always be conditional because who knows what happens. I mean, heck, From 19 into 20, no one could have known that that kind of pandemic shock was coming. So everything's got to be conditional at some level. And I think maybe sometimes they let that part of the communication slip a bit. But look, I think market participants, right, have to realize that in fact it is conditional. Just look last meeting, not the one from yesterday, but the one in June, where they hiked 75 basis points after explicitly guiding to 50 basis points. So clearly they are willing to break 
with the guidance they've given us if they feel it's necessary. I would love to live in a world where they communicated a bit more in terms of their reaction function and less in terms of like, here's exactly what we're going to do. I think that would achieve a lot of the benefits of forward guidance without having sort of this drawback of this creates unconditionality. I was a huge fan, although this only lasted a couple of months, but I was a huge fan of the Evans rule. I thought when they were sort of withdrawing or slowly considering withdrawing policy kind of as we were coming out of the GFC, I thought that was a good way of like giving us a clue as to when they might just move off zero. Now, you wouldn't use that same rule every time. You would use a rule that was appropriate or a guide, I guess, that was appropriate for the moment. So today's would be a lot more about inflation, a lot less about unemployment. But I think things like that are are pretty useful because it allows us market participants to think more in terms of the data and less in terms of just what's the Fed telling me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's focus in on that point about you, the market participant, trying to read the Fed's forward guidance. You get it directly from them sometimes, but sometimes you get it from other sources. So going back to the June FOMC meeting where they had been signaling 50, 50, 50, and then I think it was Monday morning before the meeting, or maybe the week before, Nick Tamareos of the Wall Street Journal had an article that said they're going to go 75 or likely to go 75. And everyone's like, okay, that's it. And it got priced in. So as a market participant, do you, you know, follow certain reporters and you say, aha, he's the one that's given information out? I mean, is that part of the work? I mean, I don't want to dox Nick. He's a great guy. Oh, he's a great guy. Yes. He's a great guy. But yeah, like, look, I think not only him, but Craig Torres at Bloomberg had a very similar article almost at the same time. I believe it was over the weekend. And that's awfully suspicious. So look, it's not wrong that the Fed uses the media to communicate things when they need to. I know Chair Powell might not admit this quite yet, but if you read Ben Bernanke's memoir, he says that we do this. So so like this is a thing. And so, yeah, so like it's something we've got to deal with. Is this a leak? Is this just Nick being a good reporter? Like, is this him piecing things together? Because he's plenty capable of doing that, right? It's something we got to deal with. And for people who are short-term traders, which is not me, but for people who are short-term traders, you got to act quickly, Right. And so that's why you see the market lurch on these things suddenly is because you got to make snap judgments. It's just part of it's part of the game. So another question is the market participant. You're reading the tea leaves from the Fed, from reporters who are on the Fed beat, but also like the political economy of the Fed. I mean, how close of attention do you pay to that? And let me give you an example I'm thinking of. And that is like right now in the polls, inflation is like the number one concern for most Americans. I mean, poll after poll shows inflation has risen to the top. And that has some influence then on Congress, which puts pressure on the Fed. And and we see the Fed has got this laser-like focus on inflation now. We're you know, pre-pandemic. They had a lot of things they were looking at, inequality, you know, wealth gaps, and their attention span was kind of, you know, broadly spread, but now it's very, very focused on inflation inflation. And I think understandably so, given what Americans are feeling about it. So someone like yourself, are you also looking at these kind of broader body politic movements that influence the Fed as well as the more narrow ones we've talked about already? Yeah. Well, certainly the Fed is definitely a political animal. It has influences that aren't purely, you know, in GDP numbers and inflation numbers that matter to them. So exactly how that plays into their decision making, I think depends on the moment, right? Like I think in this moment, they're on the exact same page as what politics would want them to do, which is fight inflation, right? I think that's super important. I'm sure they're aware of how poorly inflation polls, how important it is on people's mind, because I think they want to be aware that if their reputation is damaged of taking this seriously with the broad public, then that will make it harder to enact policy in the future. And if the broad public creates pressure around inflation, then Congress might do some things that aren't very smart. I mean, there is not a great history of politicians trying to fight inflation. So I think all those things probably do influence them. They want to they want to make sure the politicians hear, hey, we're on the case. You don't need to do anything crazy over here. Yes. And this gets to a deeper question about what does monetary policy actually do? And, and again, the Elamide episode We talked about this, so I encourage listeners to go back and check it out if they haven't already. But she mentioned, you know, her work on inflation targeting central banks and how it adds credibility. And and the idea being that central bankers themselves can take a stand and, you know, push for inflation. If they have the independence, they can take a stand and make a difference. 
where someone like Adam Posen, he would argue that central banks' desire for price stability is driven by the body politics. So, you know, it's the preferences of what the country wants. So, you know, how did Paul Volcker have the ability to push through his war on inflation? Well, there are people who didn't like it, but overall, it was the number one again, issue in polls, and he had the support. He's doing what was wanted. And, and most Americans want price stability, I guess, is what you could argue here. You know, how much degrees of freedom does the Fed actually have versus how much are they just a representation of what society wants? So I know that's kind of a deeper philosophical question than Fed watching per se. So let's move on to one other point I want to raise about the FOMC and anything else you want to add about it as well. So one thing that struck me is that Chair Powell repeatedly said, we are committed to getting back down to 2% inflation. I mean, multiple times he said this, and I made this comment on Twitter, but I think this really underscores that the Fed is still fully 100% on board with its target and it's not giving any kind of consideration to some of the suggestions that have been made well, the Fed could stop at 3%. Let's just make it a 3%, you know, an opportunistic change of targets. It seems pretty clear they're not going to settle. They're going to go all the way down to two. Is that your takeaway? That is definitely my take. I think if they wanted, if they had in their heart of hearts, like, no, maybe 3% would be a better target. The pandemic would have been a great time to do it when we were deeper into it. Like now, even if they wanted to, it would be pretty damaging reputationally. It would sound like you were sort of giving up on the prior goal at a time when, as you said, politically, like that would be disastrous. I will say you need to separate the thought of where do they want inflation to end up with where they might pause rate hikes, right? Because they may, in fact, I think they probably would stop hiking rates. If inflation was rapidly falling as it got around three, they might say, well, we can pause here and see where it goes. But that is not at all a sign that they're satisfied with three. I think they would be expecting it just to keep falling. And, and if it didn't, they would rekindle the rate hikes. Okay. Any other thoughts from the FOMC meeting? I want to move on to interest rates, but you go ahead. The only thing I would just say is I think, you know, Powell, he's still very clearly trying to tighten financial conditions. I mentioned there was that question about they're going to rate cuts in 23 and 24. And he's like, nah, I think I think you should pay attention to the dots is what he kept saying. If he was OK with conditions loosening up, he would have let them loosen up. But instead, he's like he's still trying to push them tighter. I don't think we're going to hear a change in rhetoric anytime real soon. And I want to say this on his behalf, because there are many people out there who would say, why are you tightening? This is supply side inflation. And and I think he's clearly thinking of the demand side inflation, right? He thinks the economy is overheated. And again, going back to those numbers I gave for nominal GDP, 7.8% growth in annualized rate in the first quarter, $465 billion of additional spending, which is at a higher rate than the first quarter. You know, nominal demand, aggregate demand is still strong and robust, and he still sees it. So I, I'm glad he's on the job. So let me segue then, and Tom, into interest rates. We were talking about them already in, in an observation you made, which is interesting that the market is pricing in rate hikes through the end of the year, I think around 3.5%, and then back down. And so what is that telling us? Why is the market doing this? And what do you think it means? And what's the signal here? I mean, I think the signal is the market thinks that inflation is kind of fragile, that if you get just a bit above neutral, which you know, who knows what neutral really is, but if we say it's two and a half, which is the Fed's kind of best estimate, three and a half be you know roughly 100 basis points over neutral, not that high, that'll be all it'll take. And that'll break the back of inflation. But in the course of doing that, the economy is slowing meaningfully, maybe unemployment's rising, and that'll spur the Fed to cut a few times. I will say, you always got to remember when you're talking about like what's priced in, it's an amalgamation of lots of different thoughts, right? That like sort of come together to make some kind of middle ground or consensus view, right? So what's really priced in is about 100 base points worth of cuts over the course of 2023 and 2024, which if you took literally would probably be kind of akin to what happened in 2019, which Fed got a little too tight and they backed off a little bit and like the growth continued and probably had the pandemic not happened, there wouldn't have been a, a recession. But it might also be like, as I said, like an amalgamation of, Maybe some people think, well, maybe they stop around three and a half and it hangs there. And other people think, well, there's going to be a bad recession. They're going to cut by a lot. And I think there's a lot of murkiness as to what happens after, you know, 2023. 
So there's a distribution of views, but the average, the trajectory among most of them is, is some kind of cut going forward. You mentioned the analogy of 2019, and I've actually been thinking about this. Which analogy is a good one or a better one? You could look at 2019, yield curve inverted, the Fed was wanting to hike more, and then they turned around pretty quickly and they stopped because financial conditions were tightening, there were signals, they were getting ahead of themselves. That is a nice comparison. There's also 2015, 2016. And I I bring that one up because they had talked up a bunch of rate hikes. And what happened, which is very similar to today, is that ended up causing the dollar just to blow up, right? In terms of value, it really became more valuable. You know, it was also related to the fact that the European Central Bank was doing a different type of monetary policy. So the dollar strengthened dramatically and quickly, similar to what we're seeing today. So there's a lot of talk about the dollar today might cause a global recession or some kind of global weakening. And if that were to get severe enough, it could bleed back into the U.S. economy. And and that might be something. And if you go back to 2015, 2016, that's part of the story, right, is they stepped back and they didn't do all the rate hikes they had talked up because they saw the weakness coming back in from the global economy into the U.S. So you could have that scenario. You could have the 2019 scenario, maybe a combination of both. Any thoughts? I think what's interesting about both those periods is that the weakness, especially 2018, appeared to be predominantly monetary in nature. Like in 2018, there weren't other problems. There wasn't some kind of misallocation of capital that needed to get fixed or some bubble that was bursting or or whatever. So that could give one some hope of a soft-ish landing this time around if you just said, well, if the only reason why the economy slows in 2023 is monetary, and if, which is a big if, inflation comes down to a reasonable place, Fed can back off hikes a couple times, maybe we can be right back to growth, like maybe it's not that bad. That's a plausible outcome to me. I do think those two periods are pretty interesting for how quickly the economy rebounded after the Fed just backed off a bit. So that suggests the Fed can be nimble, it can turn on a dime, and financial conditions will respond. Going back earlier to what you said, the power forward guidance and and market participants doing the heavy lifting, whether it's tightening or easing, That story, what's different, right, is we've got this massive inflation problem. So if inflation isn't coming down quickly enough, I think that's how you get to the hard landing, right? The Fed can't do that reversal. Maybe the only problem still is monetary, but the Fed can't do that reversal quickly because inflation's not responding in real time. Now, you mentioned a moment ago the idea that, you know, inflation might be predominantly demand side. If that's true, then it probably is correct that inflation's kind of fragile, right? That all we got to do is get demand down enough and the inflation starts going away quickly. My view is that like it didn't appear that the relationship between output and demand to price, it didn't appear to be linear on the way up. So it might not be linear on the way down. In other words, it might take a small amount of demand shift to bring inflation lower. And if so, like that's kind of a hopeful sign, right? That could mean like, well, we need a little bit of a blip, but after that, the economy's probably with a good foundation. Well, I hope that happens. And to be clear, I'm not certain that inflation is a majority or driven mostly by demand. I, I think demand is an important part, but it'd be hard for me to kind of break up, you know, 50% here, 50% there, because I think we both agree, you know, supply side stories are still at play. I guess what we need, Tom, is we need some good luck. So supply side sorts itself out, the war ends in Russia, <laughs> Ukraine, and we need this nonlinear effect that you just talked about. And kind of a, what's the opposite of a perfect storm, a, a perfect, you know, <laughs> coincidence. Perfectly of, sunny day. Dude. Perfectly sunny day. Day where everything comes together, we have a soft landing, inflation comes down, and we can look back and reflect on the lessons learned from this amazing period. Okay, let's use that to segue into interest rate theory. So what we've been talking about is the Fed shaping expectations, kind of a standard long-term theory of interest rates, like what drives a 10-year treasury yield is, well, it's the expected path of what the Fed's going to do, plus some kind of term premium, some kind of risk compensation. And what is your theory of interest rates? When you think about that, when you're investing in, say, long-term treasuries, what are you thinking through as you process that? I do think that kind of forward rate anticipation theory, if you will, is pretty dominant. So, you know, at least in the timeframes I need to deal with, right, which are kind of day by day, week by week, month by month, I think, you know, what you see the biggest delta in rates tends to be because there's some delta in the view of where the Fed's going to be. Now, I do think there's this sort of conversation, does the Fed control interest rates or does the market set interest rates? I think it's not an either or, right? A moment ago, we were just saying 
you know, Powell is trying to tell us, no, no, we're still going to be hiking in 23, 24. And the market's saying, I don't think you will be, right? And so I think the rates are primarily being set by this anticipation of where the Fed's going to be. I still think that doesn't leave the Fed in control of anything, right? The market is still forming its own opinion about where things are going to be. Yeah, so let me share my theory with you, and then you can tell me whether it's worth anything in the marketplace. <laughs> so I think you know the short-run theory that comes from Keynes, kind of the liquidity preference theory, that's a money view that says central banks do determine interest rates in the short term. They can you know literally push them up, push them down. They have that influence. But over the longer run, I, I buy into more of the, the savings investment story, kind of a fundamental story. And I say that given that the Fed has a price stability mandate. So if the Fed cares about price stability, then over the long run, it has to respond to fundamentals. So when you said, you know, the markets say, no, you're going to cut in 2023. The market knows the Fed has to respond to the fundamentals if it wants to fulfill its mandate. So given that assumption, in some level, the fundamentals are determining where rates go, but it's a combination of references. What do you want? Price stability, full employment, as well as what drives kind of the long run real equilibrium interest rate. I guess what I would say is, we're probably not disagreeing actually, David, but like what I would say is, the way I would think about that is like, that is what sets where like neutral policy is or what point financial conditions get tight versus when are they loose, right? So if the Fed is trying to deviate from that, you know, savings investment balance position, then it's maybe deleteriously influencing the pace of activity or what have you, right? So one way or the other, right? So I think the literal nominal, you know, treasury rate that gets traded every day is probably set purely by Fed expectations. What that rate means is probably set by the conditions you're describing. Okay. What about like a 20-year treasury? When people trade 20-year treasuries, are they thinking, well, I expect inflation to be 2% in the long run and the real treasury yield to be, you know, based on fundamentals? Is, is there any of that thinking that goes on? The way I try to encourage young analysts who ask me (laughs) how to think about it is the shorter you are, the more it's directly influenced by the Fed, because we can kind of guess where the Fed's going to be over the next year or two. The longer you go, the more it's got to be, well, over the long run, this is kind of the neutral rate and this is kind of the inflation rate and this is where it is, right? So so I think you're right on, like with a 30-year treasury, right, that becomes a big deal. Now, I will say also the further out you go as a practical matter, there's a preferred habitat issue that comes to fore. So like there's a lot of investors that strongly prefer really long-term investments for liability reasons, which is why sometimes there's some funky things that happen out really long. And why I personally, like as an investor, I got to be involved in all parts of the market. But as kind of thinking about where policy is, I kind of stop paying attention after the tenure. <laughs> tenure is it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned preferred habitat, which would lend support to the notion that QE does have a real effect. I mean, the whole portfolio balance theory. That's interesting to hear you say that. So we have long-term interest rates. We've talked about that. I want to move to another part of interest rates, and that is the implicit forecast for inflation we can get out of treasury security. So the difference between a regular nominal treasury bond and then a, a TIPS or Treasury Inflation Protected Security. And I follow those, and I also know there's some problems with them. But what does the market think of them? I mean, what's your take on those type of securities? I think you can take them seriously, but not literally. So so in other words, like I think, you know, like right now, for instance, if you do a forward rate on the tips and look at what you know the average inflation rate is going to be starting two years out, three years, so meaning basically 24, 25, and 26, right? Just add those three years up. It's only 2.3% or so. I think you can take that seriously. You can say, well, so the market thinks inflation is going to get soft. You know, CPI usually runs slightly above PCE. So that's about right. That's about right, you know. But I think you want to be careful taking them literally in the sense that if they say 2.4 or 2.5 or 2.3, there's probably not much signal in that. There's a lot more messiness of tips are less liquid than treasury. So that can matter, particularly when there's stress, right? Then there tends to be a bit more of a premium for the liquidity and that can get in the way of things. And then lastly, you know, the tips can be really influenced by oil prices, particularly because they work off headline CPI. 
And so if you've got a spike in oil that might not be affecting anything else, it just oil tends to be a bit more volatile than food prices, but that's also another one. But that can move tips by a lot. So I, I don't know that you know you want to get too excited if they move 10 base points one way or the other, but I do think it's giving you a signal and overall. Well, you just answered a question I had about tips, which I've noticed, you know, the break-even inflation does tend to move with oil prices. And, and my theory has been what you just said, that the only reason this makes sense is because, you know, traders are looking at what's going to be the next CPI number. And they know that in oil, at least it may be a smaller part of the U.S. economy as time goes on, but it's still marginally very important. It's, it's a big changer from month to month. And so is, is that a common understanding, common wisdom in the bond market? I think so. And I think that's been true for for like quite a while. So sometimes when there's a pattern that's been true for a long time, people start training algorithms to trade on them. The signal to noise effect can diminish. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. So Tom, let's, let's switch gears to another potential influence on inflation and therefore on interest rates. And that's fiscal policy. And there's many different ways you could look at this. And we we mentioned earlier, the tailwinds are beginning to unwind. And you could argue, you know, the fiscal policy, the checks and and such, they would have made a difference. And now they're, they're winding down. That's one story you could tell about how fiscal policy affects inflation. And of course, my colleagues would say, ah, oh, but the Fed has the final say so. But put that to the side. They add helicopter drops. They can make a difference. And so do Treasury people like yourself follow them? That's one channel. This other channel, though, is more of this, like the fiscal theory, the price level. And there's a part of it that I think is true, but they would say the expected path of the U.S. government's you know, public finances, is it healthy? Is it getting worse? that's going to affect trend inflation. So whether the you know, government's going to be insolvent in 50 years or we're getting close to that, we should see inflation go up today. So I don't know if you want to take a stab at either of those stories and what you think it means for the market. This might get a little into what's the difference between how practitioners think about things and academics think about things. But like I'm laser focused on factors, variables that I can show make a difference for prices, right? Otherwise, it's not that useful to me. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time thinking about it. And so if you take the simplest one of the sorts of things you brought up is just simple bond supply. Are there going to be more treasury bonds or less treasury bonds because the deficit's bigger or smaller, right? I've never been able to make that work as an explanatory variable at all. Now, They would take away my economics degree if I said supply doesn't matter. So what I think that actually says is that the demand is dominant over supply, right? So what's a plausible story here is that if there's a larger stock of debt, right, thus sort of total supply is bigger, right, that that's a small but persistent effect. Whereas the changes in, you know, how much I want to own treasuries are large and they're moment by moment. And that's the driving force. But it's a good example where as a practitioner, like small but persistent, I don't know if I've got a lot of time for that, right? Like I, I can't worry about that too much. The other thing goes to this kind of practitioner, I'm going to focus really on things that I can wrap my hands around, right? And like appear to have an effect in a predictable way. So in this case, this turns the sort of fiscal theory of the price up. It's hard for me to see how actors in the economy have sat around and calculated at what point the government is going to be insolvent. Like, I just don't see businesses acting that way. I don't see individuals acting that way. I don't see traders acting that way. I don't want to be overly dismissive. I just want to say, "Mm, that's hard for me to wrap my hands around. So I don't know that I'm going to think about that too much, if that makes sense. Now, I'll observe that (laughs) we've had a very large increase in the stock of debt since COVID. And we've had a large increase in inflation, but the timing of that certainly appeared to be related to when did consumers start spending that money, right? Not when did the debt show up, right? So admittedly, there's not that much of a time gap between those two, but it sure seems to me like if we're talking about like how does fiscal policy translate to inflation, it sure seems like it matters when does the money wind up in consumers' hands. I mean, heck, before COVID hit, what was the big debate in macro world, which was, can we even generate inflation if we wanted to? Like, who knows? Like, I think we sort of answered that question. If we mail people checks, there's going to be some inflation. But it didn't appear to be based on the stock of debt at all. That just didn't seem to matter. We sure raised debt a heck of a lot 
after 08 too, and it didn't seem to matter that much. So it needed to be a helicopter drop that was permanent and given the households, consumers to spend. So let me phrase the question this way a little bit differently. So we talked about the 30 year, the 20, the 10. I mean, the 10 year, I believe today is down under 2.7%. It's had a hard time getting past three. It was there for a little bit and it keeps falling down, which is really remarkable. You just mentioned, you know, we had a huge increase in the stock of debt, about $5 trillion. If you go to the CBO, it's projecting sustained deficits going forward as far as the eye can see. And, you know, some people worry about Social Security, will it be funded? And all these other unfunded liabilities, you know, the government's on the books for. So you have all these worries and there's some people who will, ah, what was us, you know? But man, the bond market does not seem concerned. The bond market's like, chill. In fact, we're so chill, we're only going to charge 2.8 over 10 years, you know, or some number like that over 30 years. So how do we make sense of that? Does the bond market think that A, you know, the government's going to solve this fiscal situation with reforms, taxes, cut in spending? Maybe it's a combination, but B would be, well, there's a demand for these securities. There's simply a demand for them. Even if you run these persistent deficits over the next 30 years, there's going to be people willing to buy them. That's the expectation currently. What is your understanding of how this makes sense? Yeah, I guess my best guess, look, maybe it's myopia. Maybe we're just completely out to lunch and like it's all going to fall apart. But I guess my best theory is that U.S. growth broadly, demand for dollars broadly, which extends well beyond our borders, of course, right? And then the fact that the U.S. banking system and financial system writ large, right, are really at the center of almost all global trade and finance, people don't see that changing, you know, like on your show, many times people have discussed the possibility of some other currency taking over or some other financial system, you know, crypto, whatever, taking over. And just every time there seems to be even a wildcard candidate, it seems to fade. So I think there's a lot of confidence that that system is going to remain so important and that generally the U.S. tax base is going to continue to grow into the future. And that even if we can't quite see how it works out, it'll work out somehow. I think that's the best way to read that. Well, that's my take as well. I think what you've said makes a lot of sense. I might put it this way. The network effects for the dollar system are so strong and unbreakable. And in fact, they reinforce themselves because there is no alternative. You go back and the more you use it, the more you're locked into it. And it would take something really catastrophic to break the global dollar system at this point. That would be my takeaway. There's simply no good alternative. Moreover, I think a mistake sometimes people make, people aren't actually looking for an alternative. <laughs> Most of the people, this serves the world pretty well. I know, you know right after the Russian invasion of Ukraine was probably the most aggressive weaponization of the dollar system that we did when when sanctions were put on Russia. But I actually think most of the Western world looked at that and said, thank goodness this exists. Like, thank goodness we don't have to get out weapons and blood and solve this, that we can put pain on Russia without that. Because the alternative was nuclear weapons, right? So like, I think if anything, the dollar's role is as strong as it's ever been. Okay, final question before we go. As a market participant, do you really care about the framework? I mean, would you be delighted if we went to, say, nominal GDP level targeting? Maybe you would. I don't know how you feel about nominal GDP level targeting. But let's say you do in your deepest parts of your heart. <laughs> would it make much difference, though, whether they went from, you know, average inflation targeting to price level targeting or to nominal GDP level targeting? So I would care a lot. I think it was way understood when average inflation targeting was announced, how big a deal it was going to be. The market didn't move. Like, nobody cared. But, like, obviously now we look back and like, wow, that was a big deal. (laughs) So I would care a lot. And actually, it's a big reason why I really like keeping close tabs on what's going on in the academic world because it helps me sort of know what's in the zeitgeist. Like, what are people talking about for these sorts of policy things? I try not to think too much about what the best policy would be. I try to think more about, well, why would it matter? Like, Like, why would the Fed act differently if they adopted an NGDP target or what have you? I will say for my personal preference, I don't know that I have a super strong opinion about what version of levels targeting they ought to use, but I think levels targeting is far superior to periodic targeting. But I also think the Fed really jealously guards its flexibility and its ability to make decisions without having rules guide them. So I think whatever they do will have some flexibility to it. And so I think there's always going to be this element of 
well, how are they interpreting this data, even if they set it up, you know, as a different kind of target? So. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Tom Graff. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings. <laughs>